Good morning, beautiful people, and welcome to the School of the Spirit. The School of the Spirit in Oak House Church is popularly known as the Sunday School. Kindly join us as we dig deep into the Word of God this morning. Peter chapter 1, verse 10, he said, Wherefore, rather, wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. If you do these things, you shall never fail. So it's to make sure that your calling and your election is guaranteed. Now, why you're going to make sure that your election or your calling, trusting or believing in God? Number two is trusting in the word that God has spoken. Because man shall not live by bread alone, but man shall live by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God that shall man live by. You must live by the word of God. You must live by God and by his word. You must know. So when the Bible talks about great falling away, it is falling away from God and falling away from the knowledge of God's word. Because he said in the last days, there are going to be great falling away. Men will be lovers of themselves and no longer lovers of God. So the attention will be, so you must know, just like Paul say, I know in whom I have believed. Job says, I know my Redeemer liveth. Daniel said, they that know their God, you must know God. You must be rooted and grounded. You must know that Jesus Christ, you must know the foundation upon which you stand. You must know that that foundation is unshakable. I'm going to separate you guys there. You must know the foundation on which you are standing. You must know who Jesus Christ is because that is the rock. He said, behold, I lay in Zion a foundation, a tried stone, proving. You must know that foundation. You must know. That's why Paul was praying that prayer in Ephesians 3 in 17. He said that you may be rooted, that Jesus Christ may dwell in your heart richly by faith. That Jesus Christ will no longer be a figment of imagination. There is no going back to it. It is uh, because till today, a lot of people believe that Jesus Christ is one of the prophets, even among Christians. So I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about Christians that he won about. So a lot of people believe that all these other religions are still good. They are, we are talking about the same God. So it doesn't matter which angle you are coming from and all of that. If you have that kind of distorted view and mind, you're not going to, your entrance will not be granted you. You cannot be fruitful. You cannot be productive. You will be barren, you will be unfruitful. And there is tendency for you to fall away because there are so many, after some time, people start coming up with all kinds of doctrines. Not holding the head. Because if you, are not, if you are not rooted and grounded, if you don't know when these strange doctrines will start coming and all of that, it will sway you away. It will take you away from the faith. You will start preaching another thing. There have been people who have done that. There are people who have had direct contact with Jesus Christ. If you read the account of Paul, you will talk about, you see about um, Hymenaeus and, um, and uh, Demas and the rest of them. These are once people who had had an encounter with God and all of that. Somewhere along the line, they backslid it. They gave up the faith. Until today, there are, one, there are millions of them all over. So that is why faith, your faith, must, you, must, you must know it. 
And it's not by coming to church. It's not by being in a department. It's not by fasting. It's not by prayer. It's not by, by any other thing. You must know. That's why we say Christianity is about a person. You see this Jesus Christ. You must know him. That's why he said in John 17, 3, he said this is life eternal. This is eternal life. To know God and Jesus Christ. You must have a knowledge of Jesus, a revelation knowledge. Jesus Christ must be revealed to you. <clears throat> Just like it happened in the life of Paul, he said, until Jesus Christ was revealed in me that I might preach. You must know the person that you are calling on. A first-hand knowledge of Jesus Christ. So that when the wind and the rain and the flood comes, you will stand. You will be the last man standing. I know, you see, Jesus said, I tell you who a wise man is, he says he's one that built his house, that heareth my word. First, the one that comes, he hears my word, and then he doeth it. He says, so that when the flood comes, the wind and the rain, which one, the flood, the wind, and the rain, which one do you think is the most deadly? Flood represents Satan's attack. When, a, when the enemy comes after you like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise up a standard. Okay, then the rain. What does the rain represent? Natural disasters. Okay? Rain, because the rain is natural. It's a natural phenomenon that happens. That come after you. What about the wind? The Bible talks about every wind of doctrine. Which one do you think is the deadliest? The most dangerous aspect of it is the wind. Strange doctrines. Paul confronted it and confronted it. That's where most of his writing is about this. Even when you read that second Peter we are reading about, Paul said, I know that after my disease, that men will come to start swaying you away from the truth with lies, with deception. The very first time the name devil was mentioned in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 3. The very first mention, the law of first mention, he wasn't introduced as that serpent that is very powerful. He said that serpent that is subtle, is crafty. It is that his deception that he used to deceive the first man. The Bible says, for Adam was not deceived. It was deception that he used. If Satan, I mean, if Adam, Adam that sees God he used to see God face to face. Adam saw God face to face before his fall. He had a, he's not, he's beyond encounter. Adam had one on one, just like the Bible says concerning Enoch. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God and was not because God took him. A mortal man, even on that fallen nature. What about Adam? Adam had one-on-one -on -one with God. He saw God. Yet, Satan came. Deception. The same word of God twisted it. That's why your faith, you must know, you must study to show yourself approved. A right workman, not being ashamed of himself, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Even me that is talking to you, even me that is your pastor that is talking to you, don't take the things that I say for. When you are done, when you get home, settle, make, he said, make every effort mm -hmm. diligent. Be like the Berea Christians. Be like them. That is how this thing will be internalized in your, in your life. 
when you finish, you go home, you bring up your Bible, you study and all. You go through those things to make sure that what you, what you whether what they were taught, whether what pastor said was true or not. Find out for yourself so that you become a personal revelation. You no longer be, pastor said, rev said. All those things are babyish thing. You are still a baby. Until that thing becomes a revelation to you. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who are you? In the name of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preached. So it has to be a personal. This is what makes sure. That's why he said, if these things be in you, he's wanting for it to be in you, and then they do what? abound, they stay. They come and then they stay. It's not a temporal thing. You make it permanent in your life by making sure you are standing on the faith. There are so many people. To, I was listening to one, one, one of them. I don't just want to mention his name. He lives in... Um, River State. He's the one raising and training military guys, um, whatever, for the president. He say he's, um, you know the person I'm talking about? He's not worthy to be mentioned. I listen to him. He's, I don't want to, you see, he's, when you see people, you see demons all over. He said that he was, I heard him. He said he was a Christian. When he was a Christian, he didn't make money. He didn't have money. So that is why he changed his faith and moved to Islam and become a Muslim. Now he had money. He said the money he has is 90% of the Easterners, that he's richer than 90% of every man that is from East put together. 90% of them that is richer than them. There are many people, genuinely are saved, born again. You can see a lot of people, they were once Christians, but they have abandoned the faith and followed the world, the things that the world can offer. Don't, don't pretend that it, does. it has a hold on you, including me. He's trying to have a hold, a stronger hold on you. Before you know, you know how he starts. After some time, he starts backsliding. Your prayer life starts dropping. The assembling of the brethren begins to drop. He, from, from, from every time, every day to some days in a week, and from some days in a week, he now trickled down to once in a week. And then from once in a week, he becomes once in uh, two weeks. From once in two weeks, he becomes once in a month. You show up. And then from becoming once in a month, he now go to once in blue moon. You know, when blue moon comes, it takes a lot of months and all. You know, so from that, the same way, you keep degenerating. And that's how people, you don't just backslide overnight. Is little by little, you are going backwards. So if you don't know starting things, you must put in place. If you don't do these things, the tendency for you to shift is very high. When challenges of life come, Jesus said it, because the wind and the flood and the rain, they will come to test that your faith. Challenges will come. It will come by way of death. It will come by way of accident. It will come by way of losing everything that you have. It will come by way of sickness. It will come by way of threat and all kinds of things. So many things. At a point, you will begin to question God. And you pray and pray and nothing seems to be happening and all of that. What are you going to do? You now begin to say, God, where are you? God has always been.
Number two, virtue. Go back to Second Peter chapter one, verse six. And to verse five, he say, add and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. So what is virtue? Virtue is your morality, your moral life, living a moral life, a moral excellence. You are not an immoral person. Living a life of holiness, a life of purity. In uh, Psalm 15, verses 1 to 5, it talks about abiding in the tabernacle in the presence of God. It talks about the conditions. These are moral virtues you must lay hold on. Your life as a Christian must depict that of a lamb. The lamb of God, which is your character must be sound. You don't allow anything to defile your spirit. You don't allow bitterness you don't allow anger. You don't allow malice. You don't allow offense. Because you must follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man and no eye shall see God. If you don't do that, you're not going to, entrance will not be granted into the everlasting kingdom. If you don't have it, if you don't follow peace and holiness and all of that, then you will be blind. You will be barren. You will be unfruitful. And you will fall. When a little wind attack will come, the flood will come after you, you will collapse. Your guarantee, your security, I know what you think your security in life. What is your security? Your money, is it not? Is it money? That's why you labor and work and work and work so hard to make money. Because money is your security. Is you, you, are, you are deceived. Satan has deceived you. The world has deceived you. There is no other place. There is, there is secu security is only one. God is your security and his word, God and his word must be your security. If your security is in money, you are a, waste, you are a wasted man. You are, you, are, you are living a wasted life. You know what is a wasted life? You are wasted. If security is, if your security is in money, if your security is in your secure to secure a job, we are talking about job security and all of that. You are still you will be swept off. The wind will blow you and flow. And you know you know how I was asking them in the farm and all of that. I had four ponds. Rain fell. The the water from the stream hit the fence and broke down the fence and then entered the farm, covered the farm, the whole of the farm up to the waist and all of that. All the fish pond that I have there and all of that, the fishes that were there all came out. All of them left. Even the one that is in the concrete, it was two days ago I was asking there. He said even the one that is in the concrete pond that is up, rain, it fell, filled the whole thing, the fish inside, all of the big, big fish. You know that type that you ate? That side, big. All left when the flood come. 
everything in the farm gone. So if that one is my security, have you heard about people who jump into the lagoon? Why? Because their security was gone. God was never their security. The word of God was never their security. Your security, you must find security in the word of God. You must find security in God. If you don't find security in God, you are a wasted person. You are waste. You are, you are a dust, dustbin is better than you. Because, ah. Because the kind of messages and the things we listen to and we hear over time in this life, in this dispensation, is uh, we can't stand the flood that is coming. We can't, many, we, that is why he said only few, only few will make it. The third thing he said, add to your virtue, to your virtue, add what? Knowledge of what? Is the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God and his word. Keep adding, keep growing. Colossians chapter 1 verse 10, he said that, I might be filled with the spirit of, the, the, I might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding so that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, bearing fruit unto every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing. The more you know God, the more you, God is so big. God is so, is unsearchable. Even in heaven, you see, in eternity, you will know God is so big. God is, the depth of God is unsearchable. And the more you know God, the stronger the more confident, the more productive, the more effective. That is why he said, they that know their God, they, they are the ones that will do exploits. So the level of exploit that you have seen in your life so far is based on the level of the knowledge of God that you have. You can never do any exploit beyond the level of the knowledge that you have. So from knowledge, we talk about, to your knowledge, add what? Temperance. To your knowledge, add what? To your knowledge, add, te add temperance. And what is temperance? Temperance is... Try to control, control your natural appetite, appetite for anything, so that you don't overdo it. The things of this world, the desire for the things of this world, they are appetite, they are passions of this world. They are drawing your attention. Put them under control. James chapter 4, verse 1, he says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members is passion. They are, they are reacting inside of you. You want to have this, you want to have this, you want to have this, you want to have this. Anything that passes, you want to have it. Any type of whatever you want to have, you just see it. You are ruled by what you see. You just see it, you want to have it. For whence come it or come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lords that war in your members? In verse 2. 
You love and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. So this is why the rioting in, your, in our life. We fight and quarrel and do this and do that and all of that. We gossip, we backbite, we stab at the mark. We, 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 we keep malice. We do all kinds of things and all of that. It's just the passion in you for the things of the world. Put them under control. Put them under your feet. Do not love the world, nor the things that are in this world. The loss of the eyes, the loss of the flesh, and the pride of life. Because in verse 4, in verse 4 of the, verse 3, verse 3 says, you ask and receive not because you ask and miss that you may consume it on your is lost thing. There are so many things that we don't need. It's just want, want. But God said, my God shall supply all your needs. It's not your want. Want is what your flesh is craving for. And so you want to put your hand where your hand cannot reach. What you have not yet attained, you want to have it. Because you see somebody wearing certain hair and all of that hairstyle and all, you feel that you you have, you grow into it you don't just live by sight because you see it you want to become it you want to have what this other person has it doesn't work that way <clears throat> so in verse 4 he says you adulterers and adulteresses your passion, you can't control the desires and the lusts of your flesh. Every one of us will have it, but you need to put it under. You adulterers and uh, adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world will be who? an enemy. Of God, you can't be a friend of the world and be a friend of God. It is not possible. You must hate the world and love God, or you hate God and you love God. You can't. You can't. They are mutually exclusive. To temperance, add what? Patience. What is patience? Patience is the ability to hold on, to wait, without taking laws into your hand, without fretting, waiting for the promise that God has given. If God has promised you, you can be rest assured that he's going to bring it to come to pass. And that is why you need to know who Jesus Christ is. You need to know who God is. And knowing who God is or knowing Christ, knowledge of Jesus Christ and knowledge of God, what does he do in our lives? If you say you know somebody, it is on the basis of somebody's character. He that sweareth to his own heart and does not change. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent or change his mind. If he says it, he will do it. My covenant I will not break nor alter the things that have gone out of my mouth. For by two immutable things, God, it is impossible for God to lie. So you must know the character of God. So that when he tells you to wait, you just go ahead and wait. Abraham waited. The Bible says Abraham staggered not in faith through unbelief. He did it. He had confidence that the one that promised is able to bring it to. That is why when God told him, go and kill that your first son, that first one that you love, and all of, he never argued with God. He never doubted God. He had an absolute trust in God, knowing that God is able to raise him from the dead, even if he kills him, or that God is able to provide him another one. 
And even after that, God now, because that child, that child that came, that Isaac, remember God made a promise to him at 75. And it took almost 20, 25 years for that child, for that promise. And he kept on holding on to God. He never backslided for one day. He never made a negative confession. He trusted God. He waited for God. The ability to be able to wait that much depends on your knowledge of that person of God. Not like the children of Israel that Moses told them to wait on, let me go to the mountain and talk to God and all of that. Just, it's not up to three days old. They say, we don't know what has become of this man, Moses. I beg, let us make us, let's make us um, a golden calf and all of that. Let's begin to worship. They couldn't wait. The Bible says, men who through faith and patience you obtain the promise. He said, this is the will of God that after you, this is in, in Hebrew chapter 10, 36. He said, after you have done the will of God, you have need of patience. After you have done God's will, you have need of patience. That is to wait. And then you will receive the promise. Knowing that God will never back he promised he will never leave you nor forsake you, but will be with you till the end of You need to know this. And so, to your patience, add what? What is godliness? Godliness, like we said, is an, a devotion to God. Godliness is a devotion to God. Somebody whose life is devoted to God, nothing else. It is out of that devotion comes, out of that devotion, as we behold him with an open face in the mirror, the transformation comes. The result of that devotion is what is called godliness. It produces the fear of God. Godliness produces godly fear. Someone who has a fear of God must be a godly person. Another thing that godliness produces is love. You love God passionately. The third thing that he produces is service to God. Anybody who does not serve God cannot be a godly person. Anybody who doesn't have the fear of God cannot be a godly person. Anybody who does not love God, the way God is saying, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, you can't be a godly person. And to godliness, add what? Add what? Brotherly kindness. What is brother? And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, what? Brotherly kindness. What is brotherly kindness? First Peter chapter 2, verse 17. <clears throat> Honor all men, love who? The brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. That's brotherly kindness. Loving the brethren. And Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 says, Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 says, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto how many people? Unto how many? All men. Especially beginning with who? That's where you start. If we do not love ourselves, if we don't love ourselves, 
it is not difficult, but it is impossible to love the world. If we don't love ourselves, we can't win the world. That's why he said, let your light shine that men of the world will see your good works and they will glorify God. They will come. Men shall come to the brightness of your rising. If we don't love ourselves, we cannot win the world. Winning the world is not necessarily going to preach to them. It is actually preaching, but it is not the way we understand preaching to them. If we don't show that we love one another, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. When we have love for one another, brotherly love. If we don't do that, the world will be laughing at us. They know, they will know that we are fake, that they are even better than we are. And when we talk about brotherly love, it is the God kind of love that does not depend on condition. It's an unconditional love. Before we talk about charity, to brotherly kindness, add charity. Charity is the good things the philanthropic whatever that we do for the world and all of that, you go to give them food and money and all of that and help those of them that are, in, are experiencing disasters and stuff like that. <coughs> if we don't love ourselves, we cannot love the world. We cannot reach the world. The best way to preach the message, hello, 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 the best way to preach the gospel is through your life style. The most effective, the most powerful way you can preach the message of the gospel is through your life, the life you live, the way you comport yourself, the way you speak the way you react to situations and circumstances. When people offend you, when they speak evil against you, when they do this and they do that and all of that, what comes out from you? That is what gets the attention, the attention of these people. That's what gets the attention. Because if it is, that's what the Bible says, except your righteousness exceeds that of the scribe. That your righteous, it must ex- because the same righteousness you have, they do the same thing. The Bible says, if you give to those who give you, what have you done? If you greet those who greet you, what have you done? Because they themselves, they greet those who greet them. If you love those who love you, what, have, what is the difference between you and the unbelievers? You love your brother, they all love themselves. You give, and they also, they give. So what is the difference? In terms of giving, so they, are more, they even give more than you do. So what then is the difference? Except your righteousness exceed that of the far to see. You can't enter the kingdom. So how will your righteousness exceed their own righteousness? How? When they abuse you, what do you do? Romans chapter 12, verse 20. Romans 12, 20. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, if your enemy is hungry, what do you do? 
Eh? Do you feed your enemy when he is hungry? Do you? If he is thirsty, what do you do? Give him to drink. And when you do so, you pile coals of fire on him. The next verse. Be not overcome of what, but overcome evil with what? This is how your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. Because they can't do this. Hello. You know what I have always said over and over, and, and I'm sure... I know that it hasn't entered yet. Very few people understood it. You know what it is? There is no man, there is no human being that can live according to the word of God, that can obey God's word. No man can obey God's word on his own strength and ability. You can't. No matter how you try, You can't keep the commandments of God on your own ability. It will take the person of the Holy Spirit coming into your life. The one that is at work in you, both to will and to do. It must be the Holy Spirit. And you must learn how to yield, how to allow the Holy Spirit. That is the reason why you still keep malice. That's the reason why you still shout down on your wife, shout down on your husband, abuse him and, and all of that. And this thing has been a reoccurring incident in your life and all of that. You, sometimes you, you regret your actions. Sometimes you are helpless. The reason is because you have tried to live this, your Christian life, on the basis of your own strength. You can't. You can't love your wife on your own ability. You cannot. You don't have the capacity. You can't submit to your own husband. You can't. It is not, it's not a difficulty. It is impossible. You can't on your own. If you know what it means to submit, if you know what it means to love, you can't love your wife. You can't submit to your own husband. It can only be done by the spirit of the living God. Ignore it, struggle continues. Husband and wife are, live, are living like cat and dog. Parents and children, the same way. You see, the day, hello, hello, the day this truth, this thing I'm telling you, this thing I've just said, the day you understand it, it will make a 300 and 180 degrees turn in your life. The day you will understand it. From that day, you will stop relying on your own strength. That is why he said in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, he said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not, and lean not on your own understanding. In verse 6, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct you. In how many ways? All your ways. Do not lean on your own understanding. When you go to that scripture in Ephesians chapter 5, where he said, husband, love your wife. Before he started, husband, love your wife, and wife, submit to your own husband. Before he started saying that, look at what he said in verse 17 and 18. That's where he said, do not be drunk with wine, wherein in excess, but being filled. You must be controlled by the Holy Spirit so that you can know, you can submit to one another. If you don't do that, you can't. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. If you don't do that, you can't. After that, he says, submitting to one another. Wherefore, be ye not unwise by understanding, but understanding what the will of God is, verse 18. And be not drunk with wine, wherein in excess, but being filled with the Spirit, verse 19. 
speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. This is evident that you are full with the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 19, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is our born out of spirit field. Now, he said in verse 21, submitting yourself one to another in the fear of God. Remember, he's in the fear of God. Not in the name of submitting yourself to one another. You go and do what God says you should not do because you want to submit to your whatever. That's where I hear a lot of people. I actually, someone, I was making a statement some time ago. Uh, the person said, ah, my husband. I said, I don't have any problem. He said, what well, my husband says, yes, I will be very, whatever you say, my husband, my husband. I said, I don't have any problem. Anytime, you should have known me by now. Anything that I'm saying and you say your husband said, case closed. I was telling, if you, I don't know if you remember, I was saying, <coughs> I've actually said it here. I said, if, for example, you're on your way to the airport now, or you're about to board a plane, and then suddenly you see my call. I say, where are you, Shala? He say, I'm at the airport, I'm about to board. I say, come and see me. What do you do? Pastor, I have already. Mm, what do you do? I say, come and see. I know you are boarding. You are about to enter a plane and travel abroad. I say, come and see me. Don't go. How many of you are going to do it here? There's nobody that can do it here. True or false? Nobody, none of you can do it here. If God tells you to come out, will you do it? Even if God tells you, you will not still do it. If God tells you, I'm not talking about me. If God tells you to don't go at that airport and all of that, come back, you can't. You will still enter that plane and travel. And you might travel, nothing might happen. But you have disobeyed God. He knows the reason why he said you shouldn't travel. And then the person said, yeah, if my husband, my husband said, I said I don't have any problem. If your husband says travel, you go. Every disobedience, there is a price. Sometimes it happens immediately. Sometimes it is something that is going to happen in next month, next year. It will come. So what we say, for those of you who have uh, made the attitude of coming too late, no matter what they say, no matter what they preach, no matter whatever it is, you must come late. You must come at your own time. Let me do a recap for you. Because I still love you. I still want you to make heaven. And what we say is that we are dealing with how the things that you need to do in order to make sure that your calling and your election is secured. Because it is one thing for you to be born again. It is another thing for you to remain being born again till the end. Because I say many started well and they have fallen out of the way. And the Bible says concerning this last day, there is going to be a great falling away. It has happened before. And I said if Satan can deceive Adam, that saw God one on one, you that have not seen God, he will sweep you off your feet, even before you think. Sometimes, he, that's why he say, let him that think it, he stand, take it, let it fall. You think you are standing, but you are already falling. Well, you know. Just like it happened to Samson. When the grace of God lifted from him, he thought he was still business as usual. So I said, in order for you to make sure that these are in place, you have to be diligent in doing X, Y, Z. And when you do that, 
you will be rest assured that your life can never be barren. Your life can never be unfruitful. You can be rest assured that you will never fall. You can be rest assured that entrance is granted you into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, where you're going to reign with him forever and ever. And if you're going to do that, you're going to make sure your faith is what? Sound. And I explained what faith is. He said to your faith, add what? Virtue. I told you what virtues are. And to your virtue, add what? Knowledge. And to your knowledge, add what? Temperance. And to your temperance, add what? Patience. And to your patience, add what? Godliness. And to your godliness, add what? Brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, add what? Charity. And verse 8, he says, For if these things be in you, how many of you that have these things in them? How many of you have these things in them? In them? There are eight of them. All of you have it. Hello? Every one of you have it, whether you are aware of it or not. They are inside of you. So how many of you have it? I have it, you have it. Okay? But the problem now is not just having it. He said, if these things be in you, and what? Stays. Some of us have been overcome by evil desires, sinful desires. Some of us, many, some of us have been overcome by the flesh. That's the best way to put it. Have been overcome by the flesh. And flesh is talking about the loss of the eyes, the loss of the flesh, and the pride of life. Overcome, suppress it. So they are not showing. They are there. So that's why he said, if this is being you and they are bound and they continue to be having expressions in your life, if these things are working in your life, you can be rest assured that you will be very productive. You will be very fruitful. You will be very strong and you will not fall. The great falling away will not affect you. And then you can be rest assured that at any point in time, till the trumpet sounds, you are off. Amen. Father, we thank you. For the entrance of your word gives light. It's a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path. Our prayer, Lord, is that granting us understanding of this truth, help us to see, help us to understand it. Write them in the fleshy heart of our being with the very finger of your spirit. That they will become indelible in our lives. And we will live by this truth, expressing it every day of our life. By this shall men know that we are your disciple, and then men will come to the brightness of our rising. This is our heart desire. This is our prayer, Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us in the course of the School of the Spirit. We're about to start the main service. Why don't you sit back, relax, and join us as we go into the main service.